Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thank you so much for joining us for Star Stories today. We are happy that you're here tuning in and we'll be answering a number of your questions throughout the program. So my name is Alicia and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City and I'll be your host today for the program. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, and if you'd like to support us in delivering this new content, please click on the description uh, links that are below. So feel free to use the chat today to say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before, and if you have any questions, of course, you can put them there as well. Today, we are going to be talking a little bit about the Intrepid's connection to space and why we are a space museum. And then we are going to talk about stars and a few constellations that we can find up in the night sky and how the stars have been used to help guide people out at sea for generations. So you see, a long, long time ago, we didn't really know much about our world other than then what we could see really immediately around us. And it wasn't until we started going up into space and then into outer space that we really got the sense of our planet and the rest of the solar system. And it all just started by looking up. So let's get started. Now, everyone, this is the Intrepid Museum. It is actually inside of the former USS Intrepid, which was built in 1943, and it served in three wars, World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. It was then later retired in 1974 and then made into a museum in 1982. So we are currently docked right off the shoreline of Manhattan in the Hudson River. Now, if you're local, maybe you have visited us before or maybe you've passed us along the way. It really is a beautiful thing to see on the outside. It's really, really, really big too, hard to miss. But the inside is where the magic really is and where a lot of our really cool artifacts are. So take, for instance, this thing right here on the right. So this is one of the four propellers on the Intrepid, or rather that were on the Intrepid, and, and one of the things that helped to move us through the water. And that is, of course, why we are a sea museum, because we were a naval ship out at sea during times of conflict. Now, the image on the left, you can see the ship racing along here through the ocean while it was in service. So that was, of course, when the propellers were still attached. Now, at the Intrepid, you will also see a number of other planes, that is one of the things that we are known for, some really, really cool old planes. And because we carried planes, we have a very special name. So can anyone in the chat tell me what kind of a ship we are? What do you call that? What is a ship like the Intrepid, something that has an airplane on it? Anyone know? So I will tell you, first of all, some of these planes that we have. A couple, um, one on the left here, this is the Avenger, that big blue one from World War II, which was a torpedo bomber. And then, of course, there's the white one on the right, the Fury, which was a jet plane that flew really, really, really fast during the Cold War. So planes like these are, of course, why we are an air museum. The Intrepid could fit up to 100 planes inside at a time, and it could also launch and land these planes from the flight deck, kind of like a floating airport. So our ship was something called... Yes, Isla and Quan, I see in the chat. Oh, and Rexo and Michael. Oh, wonderful. Yes, everyone. This is something called an aircraft carrier because it carried aircraft across the ocean. But the space part, everyone, is sometimes where people get a little confused. We are a sea, an air. Why are we also a space museum? Well, take a look at this. Can anyone tell me what this thing is? It's this big, black, almost light bulb shaped thing that says United States on it. It's got a flag. Some people say it kind of even looks like an ice cream cone, kind of tilted on its side. So this thing, everyone, is something called a space capsule. And it's very special because this is how astronauts used to go up into outer space. Now, looking at it, you probably would say, yeah, it doesn't look very big. Anyone want to tell me how many people do you think could fit inside of this capsule? Take a guess. Capsules like these rode up on top of a rocket. The rocket, of course, is that thing that goes into space. There's lots of fire that comes out of the bottom, right? We've seen a few of these on the news lately. But then once they go up into space, they separate out from the rockets. And then, you know, those capsules are up there kind of floating around to complete their missions. So a while ago, in the 1960s, during the Cold War era, NASA, which is our space program, was part of something called the Space Race with the Soviet Union. And the goal of this was to get all the way up to the moon. 
course, you don't just roll out of bed and end up on the moon. We, of course, had to take a couple of other little baby steps to get up there first. So that was stuff like figuring out, you know, how to even get into space in the first place, developing these rockets. And then, of course, breathing up there and eating and sleeping and working for long periods of time and that sort of thing. So these capsules were part of something called Project Mercury. And this is what the Mercury capsule, Aurora, looked like. Now, here, you can actually also see it on top of a rocket. It's that little black cone on the top. And yeah, again, very, very small. Only one person could fit inside of it. If you said one, you would be right. I see you, Rexo. Awesome. Now, in 1962, an astronaut named Scott Carpenter, right there on the left, went up inside of the Mercury capsule, just like this one. And, well, have we ever heard that word before? Mercury? What is Mercury? Why do you think they called these missions Mercury, the Mercury program? Any ideas? Well, let's take a look. You might have heard of Mercury before because it is the name of one of the planets in our solar system. It and many other planets got their name from Roman mythology. So Mercury was the name of the messenger god. He was kind of like their mailman, you could say. He was known for being really, really fast. And often you might see him depicted kind of like this. There he is. So you can see those wings on his helmet and his shoes. So it really makes him go fast. He was a really, really fast mailman. So the planet Mercury is both our first planet from the sun. And as its name might suggest, it is also the fastest. One year on Mercury takes only 88 days, while it takes us 365 days to go around the sun here on Earth. So America wanted to be the first and the fastest to get to the moon. And that's why they called it the Mercury program. So back to the Aurora 7 and Scott Carpenter. At this time in the space program, when capsules were coming back home, they wanted to pick a softer landing spot so that they would, you know, splash down into the water with parachutes to slow them down instead of crash landing on Earth because that would hurt. And then, of course, afterwards, since they were just out there floating around in the middle of the ocean, someone would have to go pick them up. So a helicopter would come to rescue the astronaut. And there you can see Scott Carpenter actually on the right. And this is right after his mission uh, was uh, landed in the water there. And then he was being flown to safety. And then once that happened, the divers would help to retrieve the capsule and they would bring it on board the closest ship to eventually then, you know, end up in a museum. Now, the Intrepid is really, really lucky because it got to do this for two space missions. It played a very important role in picking up astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the reason why we are a space museum. In fact, here is Scott Carpenter on board the ship right after he was picked up. He's still there in his Mercury spacesuit, surrounded by officers and onlookers on board of the Intrepid after being picked up in 1962. So a very special occasion indeed that we celebrated. Now, after the Mercury missions and Scott Carpenter, NASA sent up other astronauts. And here you can see Gus Grissom and John Young. And they went up inside of the Gemini 3 capsule. And similarly, when they were done, they also splashed down into the water and they were retrieved by the Intrepid the very same way. But I wanna talk a little bit about the name of those missions for a second too, the Gemini missions. What does Gemini mean? Tell me in the chat if you know. Take a look at these pictures and think about how it might be a little different than the Mercury missions that came before it, maybe the number of people. And remember that this was called Project Gemini. So where have we ever heard that word before? What does Gemini mean? What is Gemini? Are you a Gemini? Where have we heard that before? What does it represent? Oh, and I see Michael in the chat. You said twins. Very, very nice. So yes, everyone, here are those two guys again, Gus and John. And yes, Gemini is a constellation in the night sky. Now, what is a constellation, first of all? Well, it's basically a picture in the sky that is made up of a grouping of stars. Long, long time ago, people would actually connect the dots of the stars in the sky to make it look like things and to tell stories about what they saw. So take a look at that Gemini constellation on the right. And I know we had a few people now in the chat say what it looks like. It is the constellation of the twins. So yeah, thinking about that and thinking about our friends Gus and John here who went up into space together, 
now we can maybe start to understand why we called this the Gemini Project. Because it was the first time that NASA sent two astronauts up into space together. All right, so my friends, before we switch to the next part of our program, I want to see if we have any other questions, any questions to get us started here. Any questions at all? Were any other NASA programs named after Greek mythology? Really great question. So yes, actually, um, pretty much all of them. Uh, you have, of course, Mercury and Gemini, and then, of course, Apollo, which took us all the way to the moon, which is ironic because he's actually the sun god. Um, but, you know, they really liked the idea of him pulling his chariot of fire across the sky, and they kind of thought it looked a lot like the rockets, of course, this flames going across the sky and all that it represented for the mission. Uh, and then, of course, now coming up, we've got the Artemis missions in 2024. Artemis was Apollo's twin sister. So that's very symbolic, of course, because with these upcoming missions, we're going to bring the next man and the first woman all the way back to the moon. So, yes, we have a lot of missions for sure that are named after uh, Greek mythology and Roman mythology as well. Awesome. Any other questions? I might have a little bit of a lag on my end, too. Are there any other questions here? No? Okay. No worries. All right, my friends. So now I am actually going to switch over to uh, another program here to show you what the night sky looks like. So give me one second to do that. There we go. Okay. So I am going to actually pull up a program that's going to allow us to see what the sky looks like right now. Now, of course, if you look outside at this very moment, you probably aren't going to be able to see stars. It's probably going to look like, drum roll, please. Here it comes. <laughs> there we go it's probably going to look a little bit like this. All right, so right here, we are seeing daylight, right? We're seeing the blue sky. If you look outside your window, you're going to see the same thing. This is a program called Stellarium, and it's a free program that you can find and use online, or you can also download it. And it's going to show us in real time that it's the sky, the night sky, the day sky, just the sky. So we're here on Earth. Of course, the blue sky is what we're going to see right now because it is daytime. And this is New York City. Now, I know it might not look like New York City. We're missing all the buildings and stuff. But maybe we can imagine, you know, we're lying in Central Park somewhere. It's a bit open and grassy and nice. Nice. Um, but let me ask you this question to start off. Right now, when we're looking up at the sky here, can you see any stars? Not really. No, right? So we have an atmosphere that clouds out our view when it's daytime. But my friends, have you ever wondered why the sky is blue? A lot of people have wondered this throughout the years. Is it, you know, because so much of our earth is covered in water? Is it the reflection of the ocean somehow? Or uh, maybe there's an ocean up in the sky and that's how it rains. No, no, no. All right. So everyone, the real reason why the sky is blue is because our atmosphere, that bubble that surrounds our earth, it just scatters blue light really, really well. It takes the light from the sun and it scatters the blue spectrum of it all around. And that's why we can't really see stars during the day. So although the atmosphere does a lot of really good things for us living here on Earth, it's really not the best for helping us to look out at the stars. Now, yes, technically we can see one really big star. That kind of was a trick question. One really big star in our sky is, of course, the sun. That's our own special star. But that's all we can see right now. And it's actually so bright that that's why it messes with our view with the rest of the stars during the day with all that scattering of the light. But in this program, we can actually get rid of the atmosphere and we can look up and see all of the stars. The stars are always there, my friends. They are just hidden until the sun goes down. So there we go. Now, when we look throughout history, right, people have looked up into the sky and it might have looked kind of like a bunch of random white dots on a piece of black paper or something. In fact, the Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest believe that at one point, the sky was nothing but darkness. So they said that a young member of their tribe made a mask out of wood, and he set it on fire so he could see where he was going. And then he began to travel all across the sky to light it up for us. So effectively, our sun. 
And then at night, the stars were where the sparks and the embers flew out of his mask. The cultures also started to notice that those stars were always very consistent. They were always in the same place. Their patterns always stayed the same. So as they realized this, they eventually even mapped out the sky and identified a bunch of groupings of stars. Now, remember before I showed you that picture of Gemini and the lines were all drawn out and connected for us, right? Well, of course, in our night sky, those lines are not there for us at all. We have to use our imaginations for it. But that is what is so neat about this program. I can add those lines to the sky for us. And so we can actually see those groupings of stars. Just like that. So there we have some lines. And what's even cooler is I can add some pictures as well. So we don't even need to use so much of our imaginations either. We can actually see all of those constellations up there. Now, believe it or not, if we look up into the sky in the east, we can see that constellation that we just talked about, Gemini. And there it is right there. There's those twin brothers. Now, as you can see, that picture of the twin boys over it, uh, it's much more clear for us. So again, it is the twins. And the story that goes along with why they are up in the sky is this. So the ancient Greeks saw these groupings of stars and they decided to come up with stories to help them teach lessons and remember their gods who were important to them. So the story of Gemini goes like this. Once upon a time, there were two brothers, Castor and Pollux, and they were best of friends. Castor's dad was a regular guy, but Pollux's dad was Zeus, king of the gods, which meant that Pollux was going to be able to live forever. But this didn't bother the two brothers. They did everything together. They played together. They went to school together. You never saw one of them without the other. And then when they got older, they both became very great warriors together too. But one day a war broke out in their country. So Castor and Pollux went to go fight in the war. But then something really sad happened. Castor was killed in battle. So his brother, Pollux, was heartbroken because, of course, his best friend was gone. So Pollux went to his dad, Zeus, and asked, you know, I know I'm supposed to live forever, but I really miss my brother. Would you let me give half of my forever to my brother so that I can be with him? And Zeus was so touched that his son was willing to give his life for his brother that he did something better. He brought Castor back, back to life, and he let them both live for half of forever. And then when that time was up, he put the two brothers up into the night sky together so that they'd never have to worry about being separated ever again. So Gemini is a constellation, like we said. It is that grouping of stars. Now, have you ever heard of any other constellations before? These groupings of stars? Let me know in the chat if you've ever seen any other ones or, or heard of any other ones. And if you know your zodiac sign, if you're into astrology, you know, your horoscope and things, that's actually based on the time of year that you were born. And that's also a constellation. So for your, for your birthday, for example, if it was in February, you know, the you might be a Pisces. You might still be coming off of that now and then going into March. Um, but if you were born in, let's say, April, I'm my birthday is in a month. So I'm a Taurus. Um, and those who are born in May oftentimes are Gemini. So that means that the sun was moving along its path called the ecliptic and that the currently uh, the, the constellation that it was in at the time is the zodiac sign. Now another star grouping that a lot of people have heard of and I see Michael in the chat and Isla also say it too. It's something called the Big Dipper. So I have a question for you everyone. Is the Big Dipper a constellation? Let me know in the chat. Yes or no? Is the Big Dipper a constellation? Anyone have any thoughts? I'm going to pull up the Big Dipper for us to take a look at right over here. Is the Big Dipper a constellation? The $5,000 question. <laughs> so everyone, I will tell you the Big Dipper is not actually a constellation. It is a something called an asterism. It's a smaller grouping of stars. It's a smaller recognizable part of a larger constellation. So the Big Dipper is actually part of the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear, who you can see right here with that big tail. Now the Big Dipper has two stars that are called pointer stars because they point to the North Star or Polaris. And I'll show you these right here. You can see my arrow. These are the pointer stars, all right? And they point to Polaris, which is right up here. 
the North Star, right? Cardinal, cardinal direction north, straight up. And that is the tale of Ursa Minor, which stands for the little bear. And it can always be found right there in the north. Now, Polaris is very important because it's what navigators used to map out the night sky. If we fast forward in time, we can actually see that all of the stars rotate around that point. Look at that. So right now I'm moving forward in time, doing some timey-wimey stuff here. And you can see that it appears that all of these stars are going around that one point of the North Star. And now that was really important because the ancient navigators would always know that there was that one fixed point they could look at where north always was. So it was really easy for them to figure out which way then south and east and west was and where they were on the earth. Now, there are also a number of stories regarding Ursa Major, the great bear as well. And I will tell you some of those too. Let's get him all up here and stopped. All right. So here's a story told by the Iroquois Native American tribes in the Northeast United States. Once upon a time, there was a great and terrible bear terrorizing the land, and it was eating all of the food. Now, all of the tribes got together, and they decided that they needed to do something to stop this bear. So they sent their three bravest warriors in all of the land to hunt down the bear. Well, the warriors were really good, but the bear was always one step ahead. So they chased the bear all around the world, through the mountains, through the oceans, through the desert, and finally the warrior started to catch up to the bear. Well, the bear saw that, he realized it, so in one last attempt, he took a giant running leap and he jumped into the night sky where the warriors couldn't follow him. But just as he was making that jump, the bravest of the three warriors let loose an arrow from his bow and he struck the bear in his back leg. So the warriors vowed to be ready if the bear ever came back down from the sky. And they say to this day, the bear is still hiding up in the sky. And every year he comes down to earth to see if the warriors are still waiting for him. Now the warriors can always know when he's getting close because when he is, there's a little bit of blood that's coming from his injury in his back leg and it drips into the trees and changes the leaves colors. So this is a way for them to explain the seasons. So can you think of a time when the leaves on our trees change colors? Let me know in chat if you can think of that time. When does that happen? When do our leaves change to that beautiful oranges and reds? When does that happen? Anyone know? Well, maybe I can show you here. Oh, yep, I see autumn. Very nice, very nice. So everyone, that's actually what happens now. When our leaves change color in the fall, um, that is when they say he's getting closer. And I'll actually be able to demonstrate this for you using the time scale again. So right now we are in March, all right? And let's say we were to go to, let's say eight o'clock at night. So that would be about 20 in, in that time. Okay, so we are looking at 20 here and we are gonna be looking at, I'm gonna turn the atmosphere back on. There we go. All right, so we can see the horizon here. And when I fast forward through time, it's March right now. So at eight o'clock, the bear is way up in the top of the sky up here in the north. But as we go throughout the year, you're gonna notice he's gonna dip down. And so now we're in September, October, November, December. Look at that. So the, in the fall in particular, he's getting very close to the horizon. Isn't that interesting? So that's how they were able to figure that out. And they would uh, associate the Ursa Major constellation and the Great Bear with the fall. All right. Now we talked a little bit about asterisms, right? The Big Dipper is an asterism. Well, there is another pretty famous asterism in the sky over here that is also pretty easy to find. Does anyone else see a clumping of stars? Let me turn my time back on here and turn my atmosphere back off. There we go. All right, does anyone else see a grouping of stars or can you think of a grouping of stars maybe even that is in the night sky that makes things really easy to see in the constellations? And I think um, Hannes, I think I see your name there. You mentioned this much earlier uh, about five minutes ago this constellation too that you've seen. So I'll give you a hint. 
It is an article of clothing, maybe something that helps you to keep your pants up. Can anyone think of something like that in the night sky? It is, of course, Orion's belt. All right, so here we go. Here is Orion, and we've got those stars there as well. So Orion's belt right there in the center, those three stars, they're very, very noticeable in the night sky. It's very easy to see them because it's the only grouping of stars that are right there in a straight line, and they are so close together. So we definitely are able to find those very easily, even in New York City when there's not a lot of stars that we can see because of light pollution. Now, Orion has some fun stories as well. In Greek mythology, Orion was a hunter, and he even killed Taurus, the great bull who's right next to him. You can see there he is aiming his club at him. But he thought he was the best, and he bragged about it a lot. He thought he was the greatest hunter ever. And of course, we all know it's not nice to brag and go around telling people that you are better than them. Well, Orion was friends with Artemis, goddess of the moon and goddess of the hunt. And she respected animals, and she believed that you should only kill animals if you needed them for food or for survival, not just for sport. But Orion kept wanting to show off and just killing animals for fun. So the other gods took note of this and decided to punish Orion by sending a giant scorpion after him named Scorpius. And they fought long and they fought hard. And to this day, they are still chasing each other through the night sky. But here is the really interesting thing. You will never see the two of them out at the same time. They are at opposite sides of the sky. So everyone, here you can see Orion, of course. Let's get him in the corner. All right, so you can see Orion over here. But as we move through time, he is actually going to duck below the horizon. All right, so he's going to be going up and over. And as he's moving through, you are going to see Scorpius the Scorpion come up on the opposite side as well. So Scorpius comes up over the horizon, chasing after him. There he is. And there's Antares, his big star as well. So they are constantly going after each other all of the time and never able to catch each other. All right. So that's the God's pesky way of uh, punishing him. So he'd never be able to get that catch. Now, Scorpius is actually the name of, um, uh, it's the same constellation, rather, of Maui's fish hook. So if you've ever seen the movie Moana, for example, it's set in Polynesia um, in the Pacific Ocean. And that is that hook that Maui used to pull up the Pacific Islands like Hawaii in their legends. So that is the very famous Polynesian constellation tale. And there is another very famous Polynesian tale, actually, about Orion. So let's pull him back up here. Let me fast forward through time again, get him back up. All right. There he is. All right. So there's another Polynesian story, actually specifically about Orion's belt that we like to tell too. So this one is, again, the asterism of the belt, very noticeable. But this tale is about a little girl and a baby shark. No one starts singing that song because it will get stuck in your head. So in Tonga, there was an island. Um, it's an island, rather, named Tonga. It's out near Fiji in the Pacific. And the three stars form Orion's Belt tell the story of Hina and her pet shark. So Hina was a beautiful young girl. And one day, while her brothers were fishing, they caught a baby shark. They gave the shark to Hina as a pet for her birthday. And they created a small pool in a reef where the shark could live. So Hina would watch over this shark, and she just loved this baby shark. Now, one evening, there was a very violent storm, and it blew down a lot of the buildings on the island, and it damaged the reef where the shark was living. So the waters rose up, and it swept the shark out into the big, wide ocean, and the shark swam away. Now, Hina was devastated. She was so sad that she begged her parents to take her out to sea to find her shark. So she and her parents searched the ocean far and wide until a fin emerged from the waters. And Hina instantly knew that it was her shark. No longer a baby, but still the shark. And so she begged and begged and begged the shark to please return with her. But the shark had tasted freedom and didn't want to go back out to his tiny little reef pool. 
So he said, now nah, I'm good out here in the ocean. But Hina was so, so sad and she could not bear to be parted from her little friend. So she prayed to the gods and their canoe rose up into the heavens. And that became the stars that they call Alotulu, which represents three in a boat. And so they say that Orion's belt there is actually Hina and her parents up in the sky, staying up there with the baby shark. So cultures throughout the world have seen different stars or seen different constellations in the stars and seen different stories and come up with different things. Uh, and so that is just one of the many, many different stories that we do like to tell to bring that to life. All right, so any questions? How many constellations are there? So there are 88 officially recognized constellations in the night sky. And of those 88, 52 are visible from the Northern Hemisphere, where New York City, for example, is. Now, the constellations that we recognize were originally described by the Greeks and the Romans. And, of course, they correspond with their mythology. Um, but uh, like I just mentioned, you know, they're not the only civilization that came up with those um, those images and the pictures in the sky. Um, so there are a whole number of other stories that they see things slightly differently. Um, but the largest well-known ones, of course, are things like Ursa Major and Orion and the Zodiac signs. Um, but there's also a lot of really other random ones, too. There's like a unicorn and a giraffe and uh, even a microscope. So all sorts of things up there. And you can even come up with your own just by looking up and connecting the dots, too. <laughs> all right. And um, one more question. Why do stars twinkle? So, all right. So stars, they give off that kind of flickering, twinkling movement, right? Um Oh, maybe someone should write a song about that. You know, a twinkling little star. Uh, but it's actually light that's sort of just bending as it's coming through the atmosphere. Remember, um, I mentioned that the atmosphere sort of slows it down. It spreads it out. Um, so when it's going through, we don't have the light pollution because the sun's not out. But it's still kind of, you know, doing that kind of shimmering, twinkling look to it when it's coming through. So it is actually an illusion to us. If you were to go out into space, the stars would actually look a bit different. They'd be a lot more steady. Uh, so that's just kind of a cool special effect that we get uh, living here on Earth when we're looking up in the sky. Great questions. All right, my friends. Now, I want to go back just one more thing here with the sky before we wrap up. Uh, if you have seen Moana, when she's out there adventuring in the ocean, you might have seen her use some celestial navigation. So she uses the stars to figure out where she's going. Now, remember we said Polaris, the North Star, is really great at helping sailors figure out where North was. North. Uh, and the ancient navigators had a few other tricks up their sleeves, too, in order to figure out where they were in the world. And kind of literally, sorry for my bad pun, they used their hands, so literally up their sleeves. Now, it is certainly not the most precise way of doing things. Eventually, they figured out, you know, different gadgets and gizmos that they could use to help them. But I'm going to teach you a few things that you can do now with just your hands. So you are going to be looking at something called latitude, all right? If you've ever seen a map, uh, you might have noticed sometimes they've got lines that go, you know, up and down, side to side. Um, these are coordinate lines of latitude and longitude, and they can help you figure out exactly where something is. And especially if you're out there sailing in the ocean, that would be really helpful because you don't have land masses and things to look at. It's just ocean everywhere. So the equator, of course, is the line that goes around the center of the Earth. We say that that line is at zero degrees latitude. And then depending on whether you go above or below that line, you are then going north or south that many degrees. Now, the Intrepid uses coordinates like that, or rather used coordinates like that when it was out sailing. But of course, they were had much fancier gadgets and things to tell them where they were. But many, many years ago, ancient sailing vessels would do it this way instead. So let's pretend you are outside, you are looking up at the sky. If you were to extend your arms out, all right, try this with me at home. That is the relative distance that you're going to want to be using here. Now, the width of your pinky finger is said to be one degree. All right. So if you had the horizon and you put your pinky finger out there, that is one degree north or south, depending on where you are. Now, the width of your knuckles across your hand is 10 degrees. All right. So we'd go like that. And then the length of the whole span of your hand outstretched from thumb to the top of your fingers here is about 20 degrees. 
which actually makes a lot of sense if you think that, you know, you've got the knuckles is 10 and then down to your thumb, that's another. So based on those measurements, you can actually count out how many degrees up from the horizon the North Star is to determine what latitude you are at. So how far north you are on the planet. So New York, for instance, is just over 40 degrees north on the map. And so you could figure this out a few ways if you are in New York City. Uh, you could, you know, go fist over fist, right? So that would be the, the width of your knuckles. So four of these would be 40 degrees or up from the horizon. Or you could do two hand spans. That's 20 each tall. So those are both about 40. But let's say you're not in New York City. You know, you could be, let's say, in Mexico. Mexico City is 20 degrees north. So you could use two fists like that. Or you could uh, use just one of your outstretched hands. Or you could use 20 pinkies, but that might get a little bit complicated. So wherever you are, you can actually estimate how far north you are just based on using your hands and the North Star. But do, did you know that the people who live in the Southern Hemisphere, all right, so south of the equator, people like Moana, for example, they actually can't see the North Star. It's true. They have different constellations there um, that they, they can't see, the same ones that we see in the Northern Hemisphere. And so they see a few that we don't see too, because the Earth is slightly tilted on its axis. So if we take a look at the southern sky, we can see some constellations that look a little bit different. So I'm going to go ahead and share this one more time for you. And we are going to change where we're located. All right. So let's say we are down here in Australia. Oh, wow. This is going to get crazy. Here we go. So now we are going to see all of these different constellations. So some of them might look slightly similar, but a lot of them, for example, here's Scorpius. Remember I said Maui's hook coming up in the south? But we see other things here. We see like, you know, this peacock. We see just some strange things here. Now, they don't have the northern star. They do not see uh, Ursa Minor, for instance. They see something a little bit different. They use something called crux, which is the southern cross. And these two stars tell us where um, south is. So let's head south here. All right. So the Southern Cross is actually just um, an X, I suppose you could say. You could say it's X marks the south. And you'll notice all of the stars kind of rotating around another spot here. So this is where our south, southern point is. And so they were able to use the Southern Cross in order to help them find where everything was. So using the same thing that I talked about with your hands, they were able to figure out where south was. They could draw an imaginary line down from some stars and then figure out perpendicular where those pointer stars are too. Now where the two stars, uh, two lines rather intersect is the equivalent of the north but in the south, if that makes any sense. The same thing, you can count up from the horizon to the imaginary point where you can see what latitude you are at. So Tonga, where we, uh, you know, would say maybe is where Moana is, would be about 20 degrees south. So that would be about two fists up. And then you would be at the 20 degree line. So it's pretty cool. Now you know how to find your latitude if you are ever out lost at sea, just like Moana. And what can I say except you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Now, last thing I want to do is head back to New York City, everyone. I know you're all groaning for my amazing, amazing pun there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we are. We're back in New York City. We see our constellations that we are used to seeing here. The last thing I want to do is mention that in addition to these ancient cultures, of course, noticing these constellations and star groupings, they also noticed some other really, really big things in the sky. Oftentimes they were colorful things too. So let me turn these off and I'm going to turn these on. All right, my friends. So the ancient Greek um, named them, these colorful things up in the sky, they named them for a word that meant wanderer in Greek. And that word was planetes. And just like it sounds, that is where we get the word planet today, wanderer. So they say that the stars that were moving and different colors often 
were wandering through the sky. Because, of course, the planets move, right? And so they call them planetes or planets. So we can actually see planets in our night sky, too. For instance, right over here, directly north of Orion, actually, is Mars. So a planet that has been in the news quite a bit lately because we, of course, just landed uh, the Perseverance rover on it. There it is, Mars. Um, Mars appears in our night sky as a red dot, kind of like a glowing red eye or blood in the sky. And as a result, that's how it got its name, too. That, uh, that planet is named after the Roman god of war. And it gives off that color because of all of the iron oxide covering the surface. It's kind of like a dusty layer of rust covering the ground there. And actually, if we uh, can zoom up on it, let me see if I can do this. Oof. Let me see. There we go. As we zoom up on it, there we go. The best telescope you will ever get. You can actually see a bunch. Oh, nope, nope. Hold on. Let me go back. <laughs> so everyone, this is a program that is really cool called Stellarium that you can check out at home, by the way. There we go. So if we take a look at it, you can actually see some of the craters and things um, on it. And those craters, specifically Jezero Crater, is where Perseverance is currently searching for possible signs of past life right in that area. So it's an ancient river delta, they believe. And they think that because, of course, the proximity of water to it uh, might be a really good place to, or rather ancient water, might be a really good place to start looking for some ancient organisms or ancient uh, signs of life, some carbon perhaps. All right, my friends, so we have reached the end of our Star Stories program today, but I would love to see if we have any last questions. Any last questions at all? How many stars are in the universe? Oh, goodness. All right, well, in a nutshell, we don't know. All right, scientists are discovering new stars literally every day, but I do believe that I've heard um, that in uh, there are at least over 70 sextillion known stars. I think that's like seven with like like over 20 zeros after it. So that's a lot. <laughs> but of course, we can't see them all from here. Um, so I think that closer is is something, uh, that number's probably closer to like seven or 8,000 maybe. So much, much less. Um, but there is also this idea that, you know, if you took every grain of sand on every beach that exists here on the earth, so every little tiny, little, little tiny granule, and you counted them all, there would still be more stars than even that. So it is a lot to wrap your head around for sure. Um, but we just don't know. They're always finding new ones literally every single day. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have any other questions, everyone, um, about any of our programs or anything like that, you can reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. And I would like to thank you all so much for watching and sharing your thoughts, your comments, your questions today. Um, the museum has introduced a number of these new live streams, so please do follow and subscribe to this channel or visit our website for the latest streaming schedule. And also, if you're able, your donations of any amount can help to keep our programs free or low cost, and you can explore also becoming a member online. Um, as a reminder as well, our museum has just reopened to the public, which we are very excited about. We are open Thursdays through Sundays from 10 to 5, so we would love to see you on board the ship as well. Now, our next family program is going to be Thursday at 3 p.m., and it is Celebrations at Sea, where we're going to highlight some of the very cool ways that sailors celebrated a variety of things like holidays and achievements while they were out at sea. So once again, that program is Thursday at 3 p.m. right here on our streaming platforms. So thank you all so much again for joining us today, and hopefully we will see you online again for another upcoming program. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next time.